Just as the Pledge of Allegiance uh, is uh, recited every month, we also recite the uh, mission statement of the school district of Fort Atkinson. That's why we're here. That's why we do this. The school district of Fort Atkinson is committed to delivering the quality opportunities and services each student needs to achieve his or her academic and personal potential. We will now move forward to uh, comments from the audience. We will open up uh, the in-person comments. Or do we want to do this? We can do, do this first. Um, so if you would like to speak, please uh, approach the podium. Just give us your name and address, and please keep it uh, below three minutes. All right, seeing none, and do we have any that would uh, that need to yep, be read? I have a few Dr. that I'll, I'll uh, present this evening. The first is from Judy Lembrick, whose grandson attends the district, thus therefore the Jefferson Address, which is 544 East Ogden Street. I appreciate your efforts in making virtual classes meaningful, but it seems way too long. Try to remember how difficult it was for you to focus sometimes at sc in school, even with a teacher in front of you. I am urging Fort Atkinson schools to make in-person classes an option like most other area schools. Sports are being played. As important as they are, they cannot supersede the importance of education. A few students will continue sports beyond high school. All will make a livelihood. The better the schooling, the better their options for vocations, professions. What if the WIAA can make a plan, our educators should be able to devise one also. Alternate days, optional in-person, purchase N95 masks for teachers, etc. Students have already lost uh, at least half a year. A portion of their future is in your hands, a concerned grandmother. The next is from Brian Went at 213 South 6th Street here in Fort Atkinson. I'm a parent of an elementary student, and I believe I speak for more people than are actually providing comments or feedback uh, to you. They aren't commenting because they fear if they voice their opinion about reopening schools, the people who are living in fear of the COVID-19 will lash out at them as being insensitive. My message is this. Please reopen the schools, especially the elementary schools. Virtual, virtual learning is not an effective teaching method for the elementary age uh, children. The data has shown that children are not affected by the virus as seriously as the media would like you to believe. The country case metric, the county, excuse me, case metrics uh, you are tracking are clearly on a downward trend. Therefore, you need to have a plan to reopen schools right after the holiday break. You don't need to add two weeks of virtual learning um, after the holiday break to account for a suspected spike in, class, uh, in cases. A spike in cases was expected over the Thanksgiving holiday as well, and that never materialized. I believe that the new crisis that is being created uh, with virtual learning format is that students are falling behind academically. You should have the data that backs this up, but if I am wrong on this, I'd like to know. Please know we are seriously considering enrolling our students in a, dif our students in a different district if Fort Atkinson continues with virtual only learning format. Our children sincerely, our child sincerely loved learning, but over the past few months, I've had to watch her lose the ability to focus and now hates learning to read and write. Something has got to change and you are the people to make that happen. For the sake of all the children who are struggling with school and emotionally because of the isolation, please get our students back in the classroom. Let the great teachers of Fort Atkinson schools provide our kids with the quality education they need. The next is from Tanya Vandehai at W8519 White Crow Road here in Fort Atkinson. Given recent news regarding the CDC, PHMDC, and Governor Evers saying schools should consider reopening, I hope the district is strongly considering fully reopening at least elementary schools after winter break. No hybrid models, which would cause for further disruption or confusion uh, for our younger children. Here are a few news articles um, about this, and those links are available on the agenda in, on the website. There are also stories that uh, said, while children appear to be excelling at reading right now, they have fallen far behind in math during virtual learning. My child is no exception to this. In addition to this, he has said that he misses his friends and is really having a difficult time not seeing them. I can see that he is struggling emotionally and this has continued uh, the school sh during the school shutdown. 
please take these new guidelines into account with the fact that about 75% of the parents in this district want their children back in the classroom. Dane County's Health Department is saying it is safe for children to return to school, and this is one of the state's largest metropolitan areas. It should be obvious that we could uh, extrapolate this advice to our area. Thank you. And that is the last one that I have, Mr. Shady. Thank you very much, Dr. Abbott. Um, we will now move uh, forward to the consent agenda. Robert's rules provide for a consent agenda listing several items for approval of the board in a single motion. Documentation concerning these items have been provided to all board members in advance to assure an extensive and thorough review that will become part of the permanent record. Items may be removed from the consent agenda at the request of any board member. Items this evening, item A, regular meeting minutes of November 19, 2020. Item B, 4K contracts. Item C, school safety re drill reports. Item D, personnel requests. Item E, early graduation requests. Item F, course proposal. Item G, board policy language. Item H, gifts to the school district. That includes a donation from the outreach committee at Fort Atkinson First Congregational United Church of Christ of toothpaste, toothbrushes, deodorant, body wash, bath towels, and blankets valued at $200 to be distributed to those in need. Also a donation from NASCO of small toys to our elementary schools to be used as PBIS prizes. And also a donation of $417 from Scully Terror Haunted House owned and operated by uh, Larry Cleats in an help to offset extra costs that the school district has incurred during the coronavirus. And finally, a donation to Luther Elementary from the Forrester Group of Winter Gear uh, valued at $2,000. And then item I, uh, the district audit report. Item J, the budget transfers. Item K, payment of district bills and the treasurer's report. That's it. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abbott. Is there any... Uh member who would like to pull anything out from that consent agenda for further discussion or shall we entertain the motion discussion or motion we're all looking everybody's looking like uh, it's december i'd like to motion to approve the consent agenda as written i'll second uh we have a motion by mrs sneeden and a second by miss uh oh boy <laughs> Mrs. Reynolds, sorry. Wow. I really, <laughs> and I haven't even started drinking yet. Um, <laughs> um, a second by Mrs. Reynolds. Oh, uh, and a roll call, please, Mrs. Haas. I apologize. That was. Mr. Uh, Paul. Yes. Mrs. Reynolds. Yes. Mrs. Stephen. Aye. Mr. Nickram. Yes. Mr. Cheney. Uh, yes. And that passes. I guess at least you know I haven't been cursing your name. There you go. <laughs> no, no, specifically. <laughs> that's got to say something. I, I wanted to say Nelson. I'm like, that's not right. I know it's not Nelson. <laughs> Nelson? No, it's, that's, no, it's my fault. I just had a complete brain meltdown. It happens. Oh, yeah. Um, moving on. We'll move on to the uh, non-instruction portion of the, me <laughs> of the meeting. Uh, it started with 6A there, the certified uh, staff Google certification requirement. As, as the board is aware, um, that presentation is available via video. The board has reviewed that video um, prior to tonight's meeting, I, I know, and the public is very much encouraged uh, to watch that video. It's available on our website and also through the board agenda. Um, Mrs. Harper, our Director of uh, Human Resources and other administrators are here should the board have any questions regarding that Google um, certification requirement for certified staff presentation. I just want to say that I feel like we had more content on that from Mrs. Harper's presentation than I had in the pre previous year and a half. Um, I, I thought it was a, a really well done presentation. Was it nine minutes, something like that? Yeah. I've never heard a loom. It was nice to be able to watch it a little faster so I could just kind of zip through it while I'm doing other stuff. So it was, I, that was a great way to deliver that. And I highly recommend that the um, public also uh, view that. And like I said, you can watch that even on a uh, faster speed should you want to um, make it more brief. It wasn't very long, though. At I, nine minutes, I think most would be comfortable with that. But yeah. um, 
it really is a, a concise package of information, background, um, who, what, why, where, when, and all of those things, which I think will be good. Um, in January, then you'll receive a report as to what next steps are for staff who have not completed that certification or how it is that we'll move forward um, from there. So that's yeah, it. I think it's a, it's a great uh, direction for us to be moving in. Uh, I know that the district I work in, is, we're, we're encouraged to do so. So um, I'm glad that we're on board here. Uh, and we can go ahead and entertain that motion if there's no other uh, discussion from the board. Be it resolved, the Board of Education approve the implementation of Google Educator Certification Level 1 for all certified staff. Second. Uh, mm -hmm. motion, motion by Mr. Nickram, uh, seconded by Mr. Paul. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? And the motion passes. Moving to 6B, financial projection and budget assumptions. Yes, Mr. Demarath will be making that presentation this evening, our Director of Business Services. Okay, uh, this evening I will briefly outline the five-year financial projection for the School District of Fort Atkinson for the fiscal years of 2022 through 2026. More information regarding this projection and other financial data can be found on our website at fortschools.org. I'll preface this presentation to note that this projection is what we're calling the base scenario and builds in factors that will most definitely change as time progresses. However, what is currently built in here is what is known and the scenario can be adjusted going forward to see the impact of factors that change over time. We'll begin by looking at one of the largest factors in school district finance and perhaps one of the most volatile this year, enrollment. In looking at our calculated membership data, which is used in the state's revenue limit formula, you can see that we saw a membership decrease this year of 146 full-time equivalents, or FTE. While there was an expected decrease just due to matriculation of our students, the amount of the decline was much more than anticipated due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In looking forward, this projection does not assume that we would regain any of those lost students as we have no way of predicting at this point what might happen next year in the future. As far as the overall trend, you can see that even before the pandemic, we were on a declining traje trajectory. And while we may gain back some students that were not counted this year, the trend would still decline over the next five years. The reason for this is unknown, but could be related to the cost of building and a lack of new housing starts in the district, the tight housing market, and or turnover of the general population. However, how populations will change as a result of the pandemic is obviously yet to be known and would have an impact on the future finances of the district. If this projection were to hold true, you can see that from our peak in fiscal year 2017, over the course of the following nine years, the district would lose about 500 kids or just under 20% of the population. Another enrollment factor that plays into the finances for the district is open enrollment. While outside of the revenue limit, the district has always had a net gain of students and financial support for those students. As you can see, should the current declining trend continue, we would be close to breaking even in open enrollment at the end of the next five years. Now let's take a look at the overall revenue expenses and the total financial projection for the next five years. On the revenue side, assuming no new revenue is allowed by the state of Wisconsin, we can see that the declining enrollment trend influences this declining revenue trend. The main factor to keep in mind here is that there is an upcoming state biennial budget for fiscal years 2021 to 2023 that will greatly influence local school district revenue. The full financial impact of the current pandemic is yet to be realized and will likely impact any state budget decisions that will then trickle down to the local school district level. The large decrease you see in fiscal year 2024 is a result of our $3 million operational referendum expiring. On the expenditure side of the projection, we have built in a smaller than normal increase in expenses next year, fiscal year 2022, as a result of stimulus funds, grants, and our own carryover to manage COVID-19 expenses ending as of June 30, 2021. After that, regular inflationary increases are assumed, including a salary and wage increase of 2% per year. 
In related benefit increases, health insurance has increased 7.9% per year in this projection as that's our rate increase cap that's currently negotiated. But that sector of benefits could be one of the most volatile given the unknown future impact of the current pandemic on the healthcare sector at this point. Beyond these items, other items on the expense side are increased by an inflationary amount between 0% to 4% in this projection over the next five years. When we compare the revenue and expenses that were just shared, we can see the projected surplus or deficit each year going forward. Under the current operational referendum that goes through fiscal year 2023, we make it through these three years pretty close to breaking even. After that time, and as things develop and progress and the true impact of the pandemic is known, the district can then decide how to move forward for fiscal year 2024 and beyond. What is shown here is the tax rate history and the impact of this base scenario projection on that tax rate. The current year's tax rate is $10.82, up slightly from last year as a result of private school vouchers. It is projected that next year's tax rate would also increase slightly and then it would decrease each year after that. What actually happens with allowable revenue and property tax property values will have the biggest impact on how taxes actually play out moving forward. It should also be noted that this does not account for any increase in private school vouchers at any point in the future. Since the district does not receive any information on the voucher program other than what we're allowed to tax for it, it's difficult to make any assumption about what might happen in the future. Should local private school voucher use increase, taxes would increase accordingly. Other than looking at next steps, next steps, I'm going to conclude this presentation with a discussion about the assumptions used and the considerations for the district going forward. As we are a service business, 80% of our budget is salaries and benefits. As was mentioned earlier in looking at expenses, this projection assumes a cost of living increase related to CPI of 1.25%, along with an increase of another 0.75% to recognize our team members' dedication to the district through longevity increases. This results in a total annual increase of 2% in salaries and wages each year going forward in this projection. A consideration for the district related to this projection is what might actually happen with allowable revenue increases. Almost all of our operational revenue is controlled by the state revenue limit and any increases or decreases to that limit are determined through each biennial budget. With the state biennial budget season starting in a couple of months, we will begin to get a picture of what the state is considering allowing for at least the next two years. This would then impact each following year and how the district's revenue actually plays out. Finally, and perhaps the most impactful and volatile, is how the current COVID-19 pandemic will change this, proje this projection. Will there be another federal stimulus package? Will the state lose more or less revenue than they were planning due to the pandemic, ultimately impacting the state's education budget? How long will this last and what will the operational impacts be? What will be needed for academic and social recovery in the district and the larger community? None of us have seen anything like this and we're all operating in, a personal and in our personal and professional lives for the first time in this environment. And as a result, we're unable to make any predic predictions on what might actually happen and what the impact will be. Finally, a few of the upcoming significant financial events are outlined here. It begins with the governor's state budget proposal, which traditionally is released in February. Locally, we discussed the board, we discuss and the board approves salary and benefit proposals, as well as any other budget proposals throughout the coming spring. Hopefully then by midsummer, we have a final two year state budget and we adjust locally to anything that might come from it, changing any future projection as we travel along this timeline. For more information, please visit the business services department on our fortschools.org website. And that concludes the presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. I think you provided a really uh, a comprehensive uh, and easy to understand document in the board docs. Um, I encourage the community to uh, refer to that should they have uh, any more detailed questions, but um, great, Thank great you. job. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion about uh, Mr. Uh, Demarat's presentation or our budget projections? All right. 
uh, moving forward, then we will um, have the school board election update. Is that you, uh, Mr. Nickram? An election for the school board will be held on Tuesday, April 6, 2021. The spring election will be on for one seat for, on the school board for a three-year term. The incumbent currently holding the seat is Rachel Sneathan. Anyone interested in running for the seat should contact the district superintendent and Board of Education Administrative C Assistant Lisa Haas in the Luther Administration Center at 201 Park Street or by phone at 920-563-7800, extension 8870. Those interested will be given election materials, including an election schedule, a WASB guide for candidates, and necessary forms. All the information and forms are also available on our school district's website. The deadline for the incumbents to file a notification of non-candidacy is December 28, 2020. The deadline for filing declaration of candidacy form and the campaign registration statement is 5 p.m. on Tuesday, January 5, 2021. The school offices will be closed for the holidays on December 24, 25, December 31, 2020, and January 1, 2021. If more than two candidates file for a seat, a primary election will be held on Tuesday, February 16, 2021. The elected board member will take office on Monday, April 26, 2021. Thank you very much, Mr. Necro. Mm -hmm. uh, any further discussion from the board on... Somebody's not coming back. Um, all right, well, we can move on uh, to the superintendent evaluation. I think we would like to just settle on a date to uh, evaluate the superintendent. Yes, so I think, <laughs> I, think you, typically that happens, I think that should not happen here. Um, I think typically that happens uh, in late January or early February. And perhaps if you wanted to give us an idea of a date range, Mrs. Haas could circulate some dates that would be possible for you, perhaps even tomorrow, and we could figure out that date. Okay. Typically very available, so we can. So, <laughs> so we're thinking maybe end of January, beginning of February for. Like is that yeah. acceptable? So, yep. Okay. We'll provide some dates and we'll try to get one that works for everyone. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Harper will facilitate, facilitate that process then. All right. And uh, with that, we will move forward to the school opening uh, update. And Dr. Abbott has some presentations. Well, as is a monthly uh, update, um, I'm very happy to provide some information for the board to consider uh, regarding our learning formats um, after the holiday break or into uh, 2021. Um, as is, I have the last couple of months, I think it's helpful to begin with just a very brief overview of the Jefferson County COVID-19 data. Um, as I think most know that that live data is available on the uh, Jefferson County Health Services um, website. Um, the first chart that we'll take a look at that we've looked at um, over the past several months is the positivity rate, that is the daily positive tests as a percentage of total tests. So as you see, there have um, been some spikes and some valleys there. Usually that is um, what we've seen over the past several months as well. I, I guess I would say that there's been a, a decrease of sorts um, in the last couple of weeks compared to what we saw um, in the neighborhood of your November board meeting. Uh, the next is related to age groups of uh, infection, and this I think the board um, has looked at each month as well, has remained relatively stable. Um, if you're lo looking at the school age group, uh, it's in the chartreuse green there. Um, you can see in July it was is higher than the other months um, since then. Uh, in November, upticked a little bit um, from, from the October numbers. Next, we're looking at case count by city. Um, you can see, um, I mean, obviously, port, um, population size plays into this sum as well. Um, Jefferson, I think, has a greater proportion um, from last month when we looked at this data, um, but certainly there continues to be um, active cases in Fort Atkinson as well. Um, this is interesting. I think this uh, visually shows what we've been uh, seeing evidence of uh, in other metrics throughout the past uh, couple of weeks. Uh, and that's the al average daily case rate or incidence rate. Um, and this, I mean, will become evident in, in the next couple of slides, but we have definitely seen a change of tide when it comes to positive cases. 
Uh, admittedly, the county rolled out um, a different way of reporting um, case incidence rates on Friday evening, um, which caught me a little off guard, So, and I think some others as well. Uh, we've been looking at this confirmed case rate, um, particularly that seven-day rolling average. Um, as you will recall, at our last meeting, I believe we were in the 80s, we went up to almost 100, if not a 100, and then we have seen a steady progression downward. Um, this is yesterday's number, and it, they didn't update today, but I was able to get in touch with the guy who does that tonight, and our current seven-day rolling average is now four, um, 39, excuse me. And then what they added was this combined confirmed and probable case rate. And without getting into a, a lecture on antigen testing, there has been some discrepancies between test types. And so they've started um, providing the secondary number, um, which is intended to account for some of that discrepancy in reporting. Um, which there's a very good case for how and why that works. I think for um, continuity's sake, uh, we've been using the seven-day rolling average, and both of those numbers are in steady decrease um, proportionately. Um, so um, I, I feel confident saying that, that that decrease in both of those areas is, is similar. Uh, as the community, I hope, knows by now, but the board certainly does, we've uh, been working uh, with a forecasting model since... Um, since the beginning of the school year and the forecasting model that we've been receiving has been um, fairly accurate along um, and if you recall back a couple of meetings there was the sense um, from this modeling that the decline in positivity rate could in fact be as uh, sharp as the increase was for us earlier this fall the forecasting model at that point was showing that we could potentially be below um, the the county guidance which i think everyone remembers is is 25 um, in that seven day rolling average um, by the end of January. And these dates have actually been tightening um, and um, as geeky as it is, it's sort of exciting to watch these numbers come in those last couple of weeks because there's been uh, increased hope and um, some increased uh, excitement with what we've been seeing in some of these. And in this forecasting model, these dates have gotten much tighter. So what this is showing us is that um, by the 28th of December or just after the Christmas holiday, there's a 10% uh, chance of uh, the county being under that 25 threshold. A uh, 50% chance by the 3rd of January and a 90% chance by the 22nd of January. Um, so if you look back uh, at past forecasts, you can see that those dates have ebbed and flowed a little, um, but this is definitely the tightest and it's definitely been uh, moving backward, meaning in the right direction for us um, the past several updates. We also continue to uh, use the COVID dashboard um, located on our website. Um, we do track the number of students and staff members that we currently have in quarantine as well as positive cases. Um, as I say every month, I believe that these numbers are underreported simply because we are in a virtual only environment that we do hear from some, but probably not all of the people um, impacted on this on both the student and perhaps adult side as well. Um, but today the update we have have uh, 24 students that we know of in quarantine with four of them uh, currently positive for COVID-19. On the staff side, um, you'll see that we have two in quarantine and one as a positive um, COVID-19 at this time. I think it goes without saying that things have changed um, substantially since I was with you last month at the board meeting when um, none of these metrics, none of these numbers, none of the um, items that I presented were working in our favor when it comes to um, uh, approaching uh, what the county has provided the district as guidance or as some of the past discussion from this board. And I wanted to highlight just a few bullets that I think um, are truly different in the last four weeks. Things that have actually shifted very significantly over the past four weeks. Clearly the data has improved markedly. Um, more is known um, and has been researched about student to student and student to adult COVID transmission and or spread. Uh, there is always information about um, the number of kids impacted. Um, there is always information that, that we were at that we were accessing as well. But in the last month, there has been a, a great deal of additional information about the transmission, again, between students, but also between student adult and adults, which would impact uh, in, in learning, in school learning environment. 
Um, we also know what things looked like going up, and we now have that experience as the data has been coming down. And what I mean by that is when we started out, um, 25 seemed like some place we would never get. And I don't think any of us had a sense of in the community, in our schools, in the state, or even beyond, like what does 25 look like? What's that? What's that impact? How do we react to that? And as that number ticked up, you know, we started realizing, well, what does 40 look like and 50 and 60 and, and on it goes. Up to last month, we were in the 90s. Um, we also have that information as we're going down. And um, what does 50 look like? What does 40 look like? Um, systemically, what can we um, withstand um, in providing a safe learning environment? Um, and that's information that we didn't have earlier in the fall um, that we're now able to use to our advantage, I think, moving forward in decision making. Also, um, it's, it's easy to see in all of the news cycles that additional key organizations or individuals um, are encouraging reopening uh, when safely um, for schools to in-person learning. I mean, we've had information from Dr. Fauci, the CDC has put forward um, additional and new guidance. Governor Evers um, has provided some additional um, thoughts on um, when schools feel that they can safely reopen, that certainly in-person learning is an option he would like explored. Um, the Wisconsin DHS and the list goes on. And I, I do think uh, much of that has happened since the November meeting when we were together. And then also, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about this Thanksgiving bump, um, which did occur in the data, but it wasn't as significant as expected. And um, I think we're all aware of a number of districts, even some in our area, that made some decisions of, of closure to in-person learning after the Thanksgiving break or after the Christmas break or winter break. Um, to um, accommodate for what might be a, a spike in COVID-19 positive cases. Um, we did not see in Jefferson County nearly as significant a bump after Thanksgiving as, as we thought we would. I'd also like to just make the point um, very publicly um, that the Board of Education have made decisions each month based on the very best available information at that time. Um, you've always taken a look at the full picture of where are things at here in Fort Atkinson, in the county, um, where are we at, and what um, did you feel was the best action for us to take moving forward. And I don't think that this month is any different than that. And as we talked about last month, um, your job as the board, which you are keenly aware, is when is it possible for us to look at returning to some in-person learning? And our job as the administration is to uh, facilitate and help you understand how that would be possible. I'm not going to read these slides to you, but I do want to back up just a little bit because these guiding principles for reopening, I first talked with, with you about in July. And these are the guiding principles that you have been working with um, month to month in your decision making. Um, these guiding principles haven't changed. Um, and I think your um, effort to use them with fidelity and integrity has certainly shown um, in some of your, your decision making as well. We also introduced, again, back in July, this decision-making matrix, the idea that, no, we're not just watching one number that's coming from the county. We're looking at all sorts of different things. We provided you with nine different areas, um, and this is a decision-making matrix that we continue to engage um, to keep ourselves on track, too, and be open to all of the different areas of our organization that we need to consider. We also um, offered... Um, in the last couple of months, an idea of a decision-making scale. Um, the idea that perhaps it's not about a single number, but perhaps it's about a trend. Um, are we going up? Is it a range of numbers? Are we coming down? And does that impact our ability um, to uh, make decisions to allow for variance in those learning formats? Um, and I think everyone understands now that we have these different levels um, that we've tried to differentiate um, for you and the public to understand what things might look like based on current data. Um, we're currently clearly in level one where we have um, virtually no in-person instruction aside from about 10% of our student population. Um, and then level two, that would be in-person with significant safety precautions. Level three is what we would say we started the school year with, which was definitely um, structured and required safety precautions, but perhaps not as significant as level two would be. 
Last month, then, I provided you with a decision-making guide, um, given the complexity um, and the density of what you were facing last month. Um, and we said step one was considering the governor's order, the Jefferson County data, the forecasting model. Item two, or step two, is consideration of the approach to the pandemic response for us in Fort Atkinson. What is our, our belief? Um, and uh, step three, consideration of follow-up decisions and guidelines to support implementation. I also shared um, last month with the board um, a couple of different options. Um, we, we talked somewhat at length that um, we're not short of ideas and we're not short of providing options. It's a matter of when. Um, so we talked about prioritizing the return of our sort of next highest group of students. Um, and then we talked about the suggestion of an alternating day at the elementary school um, schedule, which many people have suggested. And that's something that's been on our radar since July. Um, but in, in working through surveying our staff, we know that we cannot staff an alternating day model at the elementary schools um, for some rather complicated reasons, but it, it's not an option for us here in Fort Atkinson K-5 anyway. Then we talked about um, the idea of all K-5 students uh, back in person and then an alternating day schedule perhaps at the middle school and the high school um, with uh, aligned mitigation strategies. Are there some things that we can add to um, the mitigation strategies we had in place to begin the year that would perhaps um, allow us for some consideration as we return to in-person um, as soon as possible? And then finally, you know, Right now, our goal is to return as we did in September because that feels like like freedom compared to <laughs> where we've been. Um, but obviously, um, you know, we'd like to continue that journey moving forward. Since the last board meeting, um, we did administratively uh, engage uh, what I mentioned up here as that number one, prioritizing the return of that next highest risk group. And we did bring about 5% of our student population back um, for some in-person um, learning since the last board meeting. Um, and we used, I, I guess, just for ultimate clarity, some very, very specific criteria that was predetermined, um, and we really stuck to that criteria because uh, surely um, everybody is anxious to have um, their kids back in school who would choose to have their students attend in person. So this evening, I would say that that is uh, taken care of. I wouldn't say it is, it is taken care of. Um, we're still not really able to engage an alternating day schedule at, um, at least the elementary schools. And some of our options um, remain the same as they did last month. So again, I think we're at a place of when and how. When is it appropriate? When is it safe to bring students back to the building? And when, uh, excuse me, and how is it that we can do that? And I won't read this to you again, but I'll go back to where I started this slide, which is things have changed significantly since November. Um, I would say shockingly, actually, <laughs> um, and in a very good way for a change. So what we are suggesting for your consideration this evening are a couple of different things. At our elementary schools, we'd like to see all students return to in-person who would like to attend in-person. Uh, we would like to offer parents an opportunity to make that determination once again. So if they wanted to change from their fall placement if their student was in person or virtual, um, we would launch a survey tomorrow uh, with a very, very short turnaround time, um, perhaps, but at least allow people that opportunity to make that decision now in the most informed way possible. Um, if we were to do that, we would look at having materials dropped off as opposed to picked up, which is a very new phenomena of the last few months. Um, and that would take place right away on Tuesday, December 22nd, so that um, those materials could be readied for use um, when students return in person. Uh, we would be looking at some additional cohorting when possible within the elementary schools. The uh, administration has been working very hard to see how is it that we can keep kids together as much as possible, as well as how is it that we can purposely um, schedule movement in classroom locations of teachers and staff. The idea there is how few different people can be with one another throughout the course of a school day. Um, and that's been some very 
complicated charting and graphing and uh, hand wringing, but that's definitely something that um, some progress has been made on since we've last met. Um, and then I cannot underscore enough that um, all additional information should this come to fruition would come directly from a student's elementary school building. Um, that would become the point of contact for additional information. At the middle school and high school, we would make a suggestion that is the same for both of those schools at this time. Uh, that is, students return to in-person learning who would like to attend in person on an alternating day schedule. And without getting into the weeds, essentially what would happen here is kids would be in person for two days, then they would be virtual for two days, in school for two days, virtual for two days, um, for a variety of reasons. Um, one of the major reasons is we really need to see what a smaller population looks like in those school facilities, especially since the weather has changed since we um, were in session and we lost our outdoor spaces. While we weren't allowed to have sides in our tents, we still had tents. Um, so this is not a lifetime sentence. What we would be looking at is um, perhaps for the month of January. Um, or sooner if the data continued to drop back, um, knowing that this isn't ideal for people, but it is definitely a way to get kids back in the building and for us to bring systems up to see what those actual uh, physical plants can tolerate as far as population um, engaging these mitigation strategies. Again, a highly orchestrated movement of teachers and staff. And then as much as the middle school and high school have in common, um, the same families would be on the same days and all of those types of things, um, there are details details that would be different from each of those learning communities and all of that information would come from uh, the middle school office clearly for middle school families or the high school for high school families. At all levels then, um, as I mentioned, minimally these changes would take place until January 29th, which is the Friday, the last of January. Um, if there were a drastic reduction in the data prior to that date, um, we would like to the flexibility of eliminating that alternate day schedule or making some other adjustments um, that would be less <laughs> um, uh, dramatic perhaps um, if the data would allow us to do that. Uh, we would also, having learned what we did in the few weeks that we were with students this fall, we would like to add a Monday uh, early release day weekly um, until the end of third quarter. We certainly acknowledge the um, difficulty that that has for some families. Um, we simply need more time to support teachers and for them to be able to provide uh, learning in person as well as with our concurrent or what we used to call mirrored learning formats. Um, we need to acknowledge that that is a new challenge and is difficult and is, is very labor intensive on, on the planning, let alone execution side. Um, so we'd like that consideration through third quarter Order, um, and then um, perhaps that's something we could revisit. Um, but I, I don't see that as a nice to have at this point. I really see that as something that um, teachers and staff need in order to be prepared for their weeks. Um, we would also suggest um, that January 4th be a student with, or excuse me, a day with no students. Um, there would be an extension of winter break. Um, we need that day as a transition day. Um, I'd like everyone to be clear that winter break are non-paid, non-contract days for our teachers. They do not work. Um, and we would like to have a day of transition. Um, we're envisioning some pretty robust staff meetings, some time for transition prep logistics. Um, quite honestly, we just need to bring things back up to speed. At the elementary level, those materials will be back in the building and there's just some things to get back up and running. Um, then we would um, welcome all students who are choosing the in-person learning environment back on Tuesday, January 5th. And again, if there was a drastic change in the data upward or downward, um, we would uh, ask for additional board discussion rather than defining perhaps what that might be tonight. That's, I think, a discussion we could, could have if there was a significant spike in the data. At least that's my um, suggestion. I know that we are going to have some questions as to why not wait until semester, um, which is two weeks uh, into January. Um, and I guess to be perfectly frank, um, I think that would be for adult convenience, uh, not for um, what's best for our kids, which is getting them back in sooner than later. Um, we need the time that I've laid out for you. We need that day um, in the first, um, that January 4th, um, but I don't wanna lose eight more days and I don't think uh, our kids or families want to either. Um, so 
Um, additional needs, um, we do need some additional part-time support staff. Um, I have linked so people can access this um, through the presentation, but also it's on our website as are all of our open positions. Um, some part-time positions to support elementary teachers and learners in the buildings. Um, pretty great places to work and there will be a lot of excitement quite honestly coming back in January um, as we start like the new new year all over again. Um, and we will have the potential need for some scheduled parent volunteers as well. What's happening, and I think everybody can picture this, is we need more people <laughs> in order to help keep kids in groups and keep things covered so that we can get teachers in different places as need be or keep people separate as need be. Um, so we very much could use um, some part-time support staff. Those are not necessarily permanent lifetime positions, but um, definitely could count on that for a period of time and we could use some good people there. I also want to be abundantly clear that once we are in person, we may need to pivot virtually um, based on um, positive incident rates at any one of the buildings. This is not new information, and I think um, we're all aware of the schools around us that have been open to in-person learning have been opening and closing and opening and closing. Um, the county guidance uh, remains the same on that. Um, so we would, um, and I guess just in all transparency, uh, today our high school would be closed just by a high incident rate. Um, that doesn't mean it, it would be January 5th, but um, you know, I, every month I try to acknowledge you know, where we're at when it looks at um, positive cases by, by building level. I don't know that I need to read this to either our audience or to the board, but the Jefferson County guidance is very specific about the number of cases and what constitutes a close contact um, that we would need to consider when closing. Um, Trust me when I say this is not something that we would take lightly and jump to immediately. There's a lot of nuances there, but it is something that I, I really would like the community to understand that once we're open, we have no desire to go back to virtual only, but that may be necessary based on positive case rates. The other thing I'd like to say, I guess somewhat briefly, is a very sincere thank you to our families, our teachers, our staff, and the larger community. And I mean, this hasn't been a, um, an easy time. This hasn't been a popular time. This hasn't been a, a great time to be in your positions or in our positions or in a family's positions for a myriad of reasons that apply to all of those different things. Um, but I stand here very proud tonight of um, the quality uh, teaching and the quality program that we have continued to provide students. Um, and I know while sometimes people um, diminish the ability for virtual learning to be um, great, it's certainly different than in-person learning. But when I look at what other virtual learning looks like in other school districts, absolutely not one of them does what we do, not one. Um, and I think that's somewhat unstated or unheard just because we're accustomed to what you know, which is what we're offering. Um, we're very excited to get back to one person, or in-person learning rather, um, but we are very proud of what we've been offering our learning community throughout this time um, as well. And again, a significant uh, thank you to our teachers and staff for, for helping that happen throughout the course of this fall. Related to that, uh, the board approved in November um, to pay for half of the facility's uses uh, of outside groups to uh, accommodate for the additional cleaning costs. Remember that 45 minute discussion? Yes. Yeah. Okay, all right, good. Thank you. I do. Thank you for the reminder. Um, so we were asked to report back, Mrs. <laughs> Sneathan, as to what that cost was over the course of the month. And I won't take credit for this number. That's Mr. Carter and Mr. Demarath. But uh, the cost incurred by the district since uh, your last meeting was $1,530 or so. Um, and that should give you a general idea of what that costs. I would point out that interestingly, there were not um, outside groups using the high school over the last month. So if high school use, but we do have a athletics running there clearly, but if those facilities start getting used more, that number, I mean, I don't think you can trust is a static number. Um, the other thing I would just say for you to sort of put in the back of your mind is, um, when we go back to in-person, we may be in a spot where we don't have custodians to spare um, based on all of the reasons that COVID have given us to worry about staffing. So there may be times where we need to um, sort of pull back on our obligation of out 
outside use just because we're unable to um, take care of that cleaning piece. So, um, but that's the additional information you asked for there. And finally, I would just say, as I've said every month, if you want your kids back in school, um, this time I would say stay vigilant and have a very safe um, and also happy holiday. But how things work in the next two weeks will probably dictate whether or not the plan that we've laid out for you this evening is as palatable as it might seem this evening. And that is something that um, all of us can participate in in trying to get our kids back in school on January 5th. Um, we will come back in a fragile state. We'll come back in a spot where we're worrying from day to day, week to week for a while as to, is this thing gonna hold out the way it has now? And man, would we, love to see that be the case and I know you would as well so um, with that I will uh, turn it over to you for discussion or questions but I'm going to return to my seat if that's all right and I can help you with anything you might need thank you very much Dr. Abbott for a very um, clear and comprehensive um, update and it's nice to have some uh, light at the end of the tunnel I guess if we could say that right everybody think see a little more light here at the end of the tunnel. Um, I would like to just uh, personally highlight that I, I liked the, and, and have, having worked with uh, administration throughout this process, the consideration given to the complexity and the, the kind of um, changing nature of what we called mirror learning that now we're are referring to concurrent concurrent, yeah. concurrent learning yeah. it's under it's understood i know among administration that that is not necessarily easy work but it is the work that we're here to do it's uh, the best work we can do for the best learning for our kids in the situation that we're in um and you've said it very well and i never want anyone to think it's under under <laughs> misunderstood as to how complex and difficult and how new it is for people um, we will have teachers coming back to us with a much different level of um, technology integration skills having been virtual for the length of time they are nonetheless it will certainly be a significant transition um, not to mention for our students as well i mean our schedules are different our times are different our classes are different and so there will definitely be some transition time there for us as well just wanted to highlight that I know I know that that has been a, a, a common a common a concern for both the board and administration throughout this whole process. Um, just just to highlight that, uh, was there any discussion? I know that we um, we have belabored this 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 conversation for four or five months now, but I think now we actually have uh, a resolution to discuss or to pass um, or to, uh, to put up for um, a vote. But do we have any discussion that we'd like to have before we go to um, the motion? I guess I, I'm, well, I'll skip to the end and come back, but I, the, with the part about the facilities usage and continuing to subsidize, to me, that's kind of like a little bit of a separate issue. I'm just curious, um, we didn't really talk about it at pre-boards, I guess. What's, I guess, the administration's feeling on how that's going? You know, I, I think the last time we, we kind of wanted to get an idea of what we would be putting into that to subsidize. I mean, I, I still think it's an important thing we, we're doing. Is, is there any I think, I think cause for alarm or concern? I think the different variable is just um, now if we're back in person, what that looks like from a staffing mm -hmm. um, side. Admittedly, for instance, this week, we've our custodial side has been hit a little hard. And so we might have to play with that a little bit. Um, I would personally roll a month and see and, and come back to this. I don't know that we need to do full presentations, but um, with the high school athletics currently in session, there isn't as much use there, but that number could very well look significantly different at different points of, of the winter, I would say. Would it be fair to say that we'll try to keep supporting that as, as resources are available? Thing. That would be up to you. It's up to us. Yeah. <laughs> I will say I that if that's what you tell me to say. Yeah. I personally would like to revisit at least every month until okay. further notice. Um, that it, it, you know, it, it, at the rate that we're going at, it, it comes out to be close to fourteen thousand dollars. I know that seems insignificant, but we're charged with, you know, we have to. We're responsible for this, for the budget. So. As much as I totally agree with it, that's a necessary thing for us to be doing to participate in. I, I feel like it's it's a, in our best interest as a board to 
review that every month at least. Yeah, I guess, and then just, I'm going to keep it brief. I, I think, I mean, all things considered within reason, I, the data that's hap that's been presented or has been posted to the site since our last meeting is probably about as good as anybody could have hoped for. So that's, that's really encouraging. Um, and I think, I mean, I came into our pre-boards with a, a number of concerns about how we would potentially reopen. And, you know, I think what Dr. Abbott presented to us is really just addressed all of my concerns. Honestly, there's a, there's a lot of unique challenges at the different grade levels. And, you know, what I saw, I, I think is about as, about as good as we can do right now. So I mean, I, I'm, we all got the sort of the, the starting point here and I'm, I'm um, in favor of accepting um, pretty much everything is written on this paper here. So would you, um, well, was, is there further discussion? I mean, I, I think, you know, looking at this and, and, and I'd kind of like to hear everybody's opinion on it, but um, I, I think as a whole, we have done everything and then more um, as far as um, doing our job as a board of making sure we're keeping our, our, t our staff safe, our students safe. Um, and now given the downward trend, like I, I, I began to feel much better a, a couple weeks ago after I saw um, what appeared to be a, you know, that holiday bump didn't happen. Uh, I, was, I was very happy to see that in, in last board meeting. That was my biggest hesitation. Um, always, I've always been very confident as far as the administrative team to put a plan in front of us that we could work with. Um, I feel no differently today. I think the plan that we have in front of us is, is workable and uh, we can succeed in that path. Um, so, I mean, given, you know, what, what's said in front of us today, I, I see no reason um, to go, you know, any differently than what's been presented with us today. All right. Um, well, we have a motion before us. Does anyone want to? So do we want to, does it need to be um, read perhaps like at least the right. beginning like part? <laughs> well, this is not nearly as bad as budget time. <laughs> Feel free to interject if needed. Yeah, it's literally written. In. Be it resolved that the students who elect to return to in-person instruction shall be allowed to do so as of January 5th, 2021 with the following operational considerations. At the elementary school level, all students K through five, five days a week. At the middle school level, uh, alternating day schedule until January 29th, 2021. Uh, at the high school level, alternating day scheduled until January 29th, 2021. Uh, early releases, uh, let's say weekly Monday early release days at 1.30 p.m. until March 22nd, 2021. And facilities used by non-district program continue as current pending monthly review. What? There are other parts for you to fix. And be, be it further resolved. Ah, yes. Sorry. Uh, be, be it further resolved that Dr. Abbott is authorized to return op operations to the same level the district operated as of September 3rd, 2020 at a date that allows operations to adjust and gives district stakeholders reasonable notice should infection rates continue to decline and be it further resolved that the district continue to follow Jefferson County guidance as it relates to the quarantining of individuals and closure of the facilities due to infection rates within those facilities. I have a motion by Mr. Paul, sec uh, seconded by Mrs. Sneathan, and uh, is that a voice? Well, because we have the facilities use charge. Yeah, I guess that makes it a roll call. Yeah. Uh, roll call, please, Mrs. Haas. I apologize. I don't actually don't, don't have the next order. <laughs> Hang on one second. computer didn't want to work with me there. Mrs. Reynolds? Yes. Mrs. Sneathan? Aye. Mr. Nickram? Yes. Mr. Paul? Yes. Mr. Cheney? Yes, and that passes. All right, let's hope we can uh, all behave ourselves and get back to work. <laughs> get started on the stuff that we were trying to do in September. Um, excellent, well, that's great. Let's move forward to um, 
items for future board meetings? We have an open enrollment application alert. Yeah, so there are a number of different items that uh, we'll consider bringing you in January. Uh, first, the open enrollment application alert, and then we'll identify open enrollment spaces. Um, we'll uh, potentially have some additional information on a strategic plan um, process and procedure or timeline rather uh, moving forward into the new year. Uh, school board election update. We will have part two of Google certified staff certification as I've mentioned earlier in the meeting. And then we will uh, look at mid-year adjustments, potentially among other issues. But. Thank you very much, Dr. Abbott. Um, we can move forward now to the final agenda item. Motion by Mrs. Sneathan, a second by Mr. Nickram. Uh, any discussion? No. All those in favor to say aye. 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 And those opposed? All right, and there we go. We'll have it, guys. Uh, that's December. We'll see you um, in January. Thank you very much. I don't need to, I don't bang the gavel, right? I know, but I almost took my mask off. Like, I know, right? Like, oh, we're done now. <laughs>